I'm Marty McReynolds, chair of the Sonoma County chapter of the ACLU. And I want to thank you. <laughs> and I want to welcome you to our annual dinner. It's wonderful to see you. It's a wonderful time that we get together once a year and enjoy being together and hearing some interesting speakers. Uh, I've got a few things to announce. Uh, one is that we want to thank Rio Ray and Julie Inman for the flower arrangements on your table. They donated all the work and the flowers and the baskets, and we think those are really worth about $25 or more a piece, but at the end of the program, at the end of the night, you can have the basket and everything for $15. That, that'll raise a little more money for the chapter. Uh, and, and there was an error in the program where it says five dollars, but the, we, we always have some errors in the program. Uh, if, if you look at your program, there's one glaring omission there. When you get down to the introduction to the main speaker, uh, Trevor Tim, he will be introduced by Imam Ali Siddiqui who is a very active and valued member of our uh, board of the Sonoma County chapter. It, his name just got left out of the program, but you'll hear from him later. Uh, we want to thank Wine Country Caterers for the meal, which I think turned out well. And pretty shortly we'll be hearing the music of Happy Accident, played by Rebel, John, Robert, and Izzy. So I think you'll enjoy that, but I'll mention that ahead of time. I'd like to recognize our sponsors, and they are listed, most of them are listed in the program. United Forest Products, Omar Figueroa, Computer Repair Center, Evan Livingstone and his partner, Susan Kanga, Judy McCann and Steve Fabian, Linda Martin and Edward Moore. Did I get that right? No. Webster. Webster Moore. I'm sorry. Read my own notes. Linda Martin and Webster Moore. And we're not done. Uh, Tim Scanlon, Edie Sussman, Tony Wilde, and Sandra Van Vleck. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the volunteers who've been serving us tonight. Uh, I don't have their names, but they've done a wonderful job of, of seeing that everybody gets served, and they are doing that because they believe in what we're doing. We have some community groups that are tabling, and they have literature and uh, information available at their tables. Uh, that is the Peace and Justice Center, the Peace Alliance, radio station KWTF, Occupy Santa Rosa, and our chapter, the Sonoma County ACLU. So those tables are all back on the way. And I hope I don't miss anybody, but I know we have some past uh, winners of the Jack Green Award with us tonight. And they include David Graybill, <laughs> Matthew Rudino, who played a key role in getting this chapter started, Alicia Sanchez, who's right down here, <laughs> Edie Sussman. And Lee Torlian. <laughs> did, did I miss anybody who's, who's here who's a Jack Green Award? Uh, we also have a former board member who's always helpful, uh, Wayne Gibb. Wayne is one of the bartenders, along with Bruce Kinnison. Uh, I mentioned Wayne in the uh, year in review of the program because Wayne handles the email for our chapter. And we get lots of queries 
uh, by email, and he forwards them to the board and, and does a good job of handling that for us. Um, and I think at this point, uh, I just wanted to mention we have sign-up sheets at the ACLU table. Uh, for one is for action alerts, where you can be alerted to civil liberties related issues by email. Uh, you might want to write, just write down your information in case you're not uh, an ACLU member on our list and want to be uh, notified of next year's dinner, for instance. And we also have a program that I think uh, will be spoken of later, which is the, um, there's a Count Me In program and there's a Sustaining Members program, but I'll leave that. Uh, and let me just check my program here. What we've got next is um, this meeting is also our annual membership meeting at which we present a slate to be the board of directors for the coming year. And that is in the very first page inside the program uh, at the bottom. It has a list of the 2013-2014 Sonoma Chapter Board slate. And I would like for them to stand up, if they would, Steve Fabian. Omar Figueroa, who couldn't be with us tonight, uh, is on our slate. Raquel Gomez, who always knocks herself out as a kid. And we, we have a new face. Uh, he is being presented tonight to, uh, to get your approval to join our board. A young lawyer named Peter Kirkendall. And he's right back there at the bottom. The others are Jackie Leonard. Jackie has worked extremely hard on this meeting. And I mentioned Steve at the beginning, but I think those who are familiar with the chapter realize Steve just knocks himself out every year. And without him, we wouldn't have this meeting. But continuing with the board members, there's Kevin Livingstone. And the, another, a, a new member, she's been on the board for a short time, Bonnie Madrid. Bonnie, where are you? Bless you. Uh, yours truly, Marty McReynolds. Imam Ali Siddiqui, who is sitting right there. Oh, I thought I just saw him. There he is, I'm sorry. There's Ali. And uh, Dick Van Agelen, who is our treasurer, who's been doing a great job of keeping track of the, of the time. And the last name is Judith Falkar. Where are you? Is that you back at the bar? No, that's Nancy. Where, where's Nancy? Here? Skipped oh, I skipped it. Nancy Collin Daddy. Nancy. Nancy, Nancy Collin Daddy. I want to introduce. I want to introduce a friend of our chapter who has come up from San Francisco, from the office of the ACLU of Northern California in San Francisco. This is Ashley Morris. Her name and description are in the program, if you look through there. Ashley is very active in the uh, Northern California ACLU and a good friend of the Sonoma chapter. We've worked with her a lot and she's been very helpful to us. And she's gonna bring you a greeting from the Northern California ACLU. Ashley. Sonoma County Chapter Board. All of our 
um, to protect civil liberties here and across the state. So I just want to give a few highlights of the work that the ACLU of Northern California has done in the past year uh, and what we have coming up. So as you may remember, last year, along with our partners from organizations like Amnesty International, the California Catholic Conference, the Friends Committee on Legislation, Power Pack, we came together to form a campaign called the Safe California Campaign. That group qualified an initiative for the November, ba November ballot to replace the death penalty with life in prison without possibility of parole. That was Proposition 34. Uh, I know a lot of people in this room, a lot of members of the Sonoma County Chapter Board collected signatures and worked tirelessly to pass that initiative. And you were successful here in Sonoma County. In Sonoma, the initiative passed by a pretty large margin. So congratulations on that. Um, while we didn't win the election in the state, we needed about 250,000 more votes to win, unfortunately. We did succeed in really changing the conversation about the death penalty here in California. Since the death penalty was reinstated um, over 30 years ago in California, the conversation has really centered on what is the best way to implement the death penalty in California. With Prop 34, the conversation shifted and people started talking about whether there should be a death penalty in California. And that was truly a victory. So we know that more and more people are um, supportive of replacing the death penalty with life in prison without possibility of parole. And the ACLU will continue working with organizations that are committed to this. And our top priority here in California is to ensure that executions do not resume and not another person on death row is executed um, until we have another opportunity to replace the death penalty. Um, and just in April, actually, Maryland became the 18th state uh, to not have a death penalty here in the United States. This past March, oral arguments were heard in the Supreme Court in two marriage equality cases. One of them, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, it's the challenge to Proposition 8, which passed here in California in 2008, and took away the right for same-sex couples to marry here in California. But the second case, Fewer people here, especially here on the West Coast, are familiar with this case. And this is a case that, in which the ACLU represents a woman named Edie Windsor. Edie is challenging the Defense of Marriage Act. Um, she married her wife, Thea Spire, back in 2007 in Canada. They were together for 44 years before Thea passed away uh, in 2009. Thea had progressive MS and um, became paralyzed before she eventually passed away. And while New York State recognized the marriage that was performed in Canada, the federal government, because of the Defense of Marriage Act, would not recognize that marriage. So when Thea passed away and Edie inherited their home and Thea's estate, Edie had to pay over $300,000 in estate taxes. Normally that transfer of an estate happens between married couples without any taxes. Uh, because the federal government recognizes your marriage. And normally, the way the federal government decides whether a couple is married is by looking to the state and asking the state whether the state recognizes their marriage. But with the Defense of Marriage Act, that's not the case. With the Defense of Marriage Act, same-sex couples are treated differently than couples of opposite sex. Um, and Edie's challenging that. Um, Edie asserts, and the ACLU asserts, that this law, the Defense of Marriage Act, violates equal protection because it recognizes one set of marriages differently than it recognizes another set of marriages. So we're expecting uh, decisions in both of those cases later in June, which is also Pride Month, and I know the Sonoma County chapter will be active, will be participating in Pride, right? Yes. So I encourage you to connect with them um, and look out for the news about about the results of those two Supreme Court cases. Here in California, we are moving forward with a very robust legislative agenda that I'm especially excited about this year. So every year, the ACLU of California sponsors a couple dozen bills, and we work on a couple hundred bills. We have a very active legislative office in Sacramento, and our staff in San Francisco, LA, and San Diego all work actively to move forward really great civil liberties-related legislation. 
So I want to talk to you just briefly about our three top priority bills this year. One of them is SB 649. It's a piece of legislation that was introduced by Senator Mark Murnow that would reform the law, the sentencing laws related to simple drug possession and reduce incarceration rates and costs for the counties in the state. Um, and this would free up money for programs that actually rehabilitate people with drug problems and decrease recidivism rates. And that bill just passed through the Senate floor, which was a huge victory, and we're excited to move on to the Assembly and get the governor's signature. The second bill is a bill that I've been spending the majority of my time over the last couple of months working on. Here in California, we really pride ourselves on having really great laws related to accessing reproductive health care. We um, have legal abortion here in California, we have a lot of providers, um, but a lot of women in California still don't have access to abortion care. And that means that if they live in a rural community where there's no abortion <laughs> provider, they may have to travel five hours to get abortion care. And women in urban areas like Oakland may have to wait a couple of weeks before they can get an appointment at the overburdened clinic in their community. So the University of California at San Francisco sought to address this and thought that if advanced practice clinicians, um, including certified nurse midwives, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants, and these are all clinicians who already provide a wide variety of well-woman care to many, many women throughout California. If we allow these clinicians to perform early abortions, this would reduce barriers to care for women. So UCSF did a comprehensive five-year pilot project um, in which they trained clinicians to perform early abortions and found that early abortion is not only even safer than we previously thought it was, it's equally as safe when performed by physicians and advanced practice clinicians. So Assemblywoman uh, Tony Atkins of San Diego has introduced AB 154, which is a bill that would authorize these advanced practice clinicians with training to perform early abortion care for women in California and reduce the barriers that many women are facing. And we'll be going to the assembly floor um, before the end of this month. We're excited. And then finally, finally I'm going to talk about AB 4, which is the Trust Act. And I have a feeling a lot of people in this room have heard about the Trust Act. Yeah. 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 Um, it is a bill that was passed last session and vetoed by the governor. But the governor has given us some really good feedback on what he'd like to see different in the bill this year. So what the Trust Act does is it limits the use of deportations from trivial arrests. Uh, it will help rebuild commu community confidence in law enforcement. And it'll be really good policy for California. So, um, Assemblymember Chesbro, who represents a good chunk of Sonoma County, last year he voted no on this bill. This year, the bill just passed the Assembly, he abstained from voting. But immediately after abstaining, he let um, the proponents of the bill know that he was ready to support the bill when it comes back to the Assembly on concurrence after the Governor's amendments are put in. And while we're disappointed that he abstained and didn't vote yes, that was a big victory, and that victory was in large part a result of the advocacy done by members of this community. So congratulations to you. <laughs> but we do need to let him know that it's really important that he vote yes on this when the bill goes to concurrence, and that we're a little bit disappointed that he didn't vote yes this time. So I can give you his phone number. <laughs> do you have pens? His, his phone number. I'm serious. His phone number is 707-576-2526. 576-2526. So give him a call tomorrow, let him know his community supports the Trust Act and that we want him to vote yes when the bill goes back to the Assembly for concurrence. We wish he would have voted yes the first time. But it's a great way for California to really pave the way for comprehensive immigration reform on a federal level. So that's one of ACLU's very top priorities this year. And I'm just going to touch on a few of the principles that we're really um, prioritizing as immigration reform moves forward. So first, the ACLU wants to ensure that the legislation creates a roadmap to citizenship that does not exclude people 
for minor crimes and past deportation orders, and that provides equal protection for permanent partners, meaning same-sex couples, who currently can't have their marriages recognized under DOMA. We want the legislation to restore due process by eliminating mandatory detention and ensuring bond hearings. We need to restore discretion and consider individual circumstances in deportation hearings and make sure that people facing deportation proceedings have access to counsel. We need to end local enforcement of immigration laws. Immigration enforcement is a federal responsibility, not a local responsibility, and allowing local officials to enforce immigration laws undermines their ability to develop community relationships and work with victims and witnesses on cases. And this chapter has also been, um, done a lot of work with Sonoma County, um, getting the sheriff, uh, the Sonoma County Sheriff to stop cooperating with, um, with federal uh, immigration enforcement. Great work on that. Um, and finally, it's important that we reform border enforcement to establish safe and efficient border crossings and promote public safety in border areas. We need to ensure due process rights for all border crossers and also nearby residents, people who live near the border. We need to limit the use of detention, increase access to counsel, and ensure fair judicial review. Um, so if you want to get involved with our comprehensive immigration reform work, on the ACLU table, which is in the far back corner of the room, I have our Estamos Unidos um, petition. So you can sign that, and then you'll be added to our Estamos Unidos email list, where we'll continue to update you about immigration reform. And if you sign, I should have brought one up here. If you sign the petition, there's a really great poster back there. You can have a poster if you sign the petition. And if you took the poster and didn't sign the petition, you should go back and sign the petition. See? <laughs> poster. And there's a really great story about the woman in the poster that I won't tell you right now, but if you want to hear it later, I can tell you. Um, so the chapter here in Sonoma County is a very active chapter. I'm not going to go through everything that I've heard that they've been working on over the past year, but if you look in your program, there are three pages, I believe written by Marty, about all the work that the chapter has done in the past year. They're one of our star chapters, um, and there's a huge number of ACLU members here in Sonoma County. Um, in proportion to the number of residents here in that county, so we very much appreciate that. The chapter has worked on everything from um, ensuring that Sonoma County schools provide comprehensive, medically accurate sex education to their students, to, like I said earlier, collecting signatures for the Prop 34 campaign. Steve did a lot of work around the Prop 36 campaign, um, to working to ensure that the Santa Clara County Sheriff isn't enforcing immigration laws. Um, and if you like any of the work that you've heard about today and you want to be supportive financially of the work, we definitely encourage you to do that as well. Um, we're currently doing a campaign called the Count Me In Campaign. And this campaign is an opportunity for you to give your, your membership dues monthly, starting at $10 a month, going up to however much you'd like to give. Um, it's nice because you'll never be bothered with a renewal notice. It's actually quite convenient for you. You can just give us your credit card information and the money will come out of your credit card monthly. And the really exciting thing about this Count Me In campaign right now is that if you enter, I think before the end of June, uh, you will be entered in a drawing to win a ticket, a trip for two to DC. <coughs> exciting, right? So um, I'm, I'm a, we, we call those who give, who give membership dues monthly sustaining members. I'm a sustaining member. Um, it's just a small amount of money every month that really augments the work of the chapter. The membership dues fund the chapter's work, and the membership dues also fund our legislative advocacy work. And like I said, we have a very robust legislative agenda on the state and federal level that I hope you'll support. So I encourage you to get involved with the local chapter. Again, it's a fantastic chapter here. I want to give one more round of applause. Again, I already did that, right? And thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Ashley. It's great to have the support that we have from the ACLU of Northern California. And I see Steve creeping up on me here. <laughs> uh, Steve has a special honor tonight, and I'll let him tell you about it.
Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, you know, the, our award ceremony at the dinner is just kind of a great time for people to get together and, you know, celebrate people who support civil liberties. And thank you all for coming. And I'm lucky uh, to have the great honor to be the one who gets to introduce this year's Jack Green Award winner. As you look at the program at the names of people who received this award since it was established by this chapter in 1989, you see some of the history of Sonoma County and the people who made changes for the better and made Sonoma County what it is now. This is especially true of the woman who we're honoring today, May T. You know, she was seized as a high school student in prison for the crime of being a Japanese American during World War II and was forced to spend years with an internment camp. And, but she took that experience and used it in her life to write about the Japanese American experience in America through the generations that have come to this country and to speak out against racism, nuclear weapons, and human rights. Much of her life and many of her accomplishments are summarized in your dinner program and in the short video you're going to see in a few moments. What the video and the bio and the program uh, fails to tell you is that when you talk to me, you immediately notice the softness and kindness in her voice that puts you at ease. You're aware that while this is a woman who has traveled the globe for human equality and the fight for the corrosiveness of racism and hate. She is not a person whose ego is large, yet she is a person of action. When Sonoma, Santa Rosa was rocked with racist graffiti attack on a Chinese restaurant, she organized a coalition that put on a hate crime forum and led a successful campaign to have the board to supervise the Creator Human Rights Commission. Before I go, any further, I want to watch, have you watch a short video and then we'll present the award. <laughs>
trying to get away from getting drafted in Japan and uh, left his family in Japan, his mother, father, and sister. By chance, we were sent to the same, uh, uh, what they call assembly centers, family. I call it holding center, Sanamita. So, shy, like a very proper man, asked my mother if he could marry me, and uh, we were married in camp. We came back to uh, Los Angeles, which was our home before the war. Then shortly afterwards, Shai came back. And shortly after that, he got a job uh, offer from his brother-in-law who was here in Richmond. So we just packed everything up and came here. Well, once I got here, I did not go back. So we've been here ever since.
Well, it's really nice to get old. <laughs> you get all of these accolades that you have not uh, expected, and you just feel like you should keep going on. <laughs> but what a pleasure it is to uh, see all of you and greet you all. And thank you for being here. I am so honored to be part of this program. Um, and I know that we'll all benefit greatly from hearing from um, Trevor Tim, who's here, okay, uh, about those terrifying drones. Uh, so I'm not going to bore you with the details of uh, my life. Uh, Steve Fagan has done such a remarkable job of um, encapsulating my bio, both on the flyer and here and everywhere. And so, thank you, for Steve. Um, I want really to first thank the Sonoma County ACLU for uh, doing this event. And um, Steve, in particular, who seemed to be putting all the pieces together, uh, he, as you might most of you know, and, and uh, um, the rest of you can hear, that he is the Northern California Coordinator for the ACLU and a former longtime president, chair, chair off and on of this organization. And uh, I know for a fact that he's been uh, rated one of Sonoma County's best criminal defense uh, uh, lawyers. I have supported the JA, the ACLU, <laughs> since I can remember. <laughs> and I even supported this button a long time ago. You remember this button? It says card-carrying member of ACLU. I mean, that was a long time ago. You know? We wore these buttons in the of uh, those order of uh, forces that wanted to link the ACLU with uh, the dreaded Communist Party and all of the other fearful people out there. Uh, and it really was not. Um, politically correct to be linked with the ACLU, so we wore these buttons. Um, the ACLU is said to be uh, the oldest, boldest of uh, civil rights organizations in the nation. <laughs> the whole uh, goals are promoting the freedom of expression, due process and equality under the law. And we can all be thankful that they still exist, bold and strong. We need them. Um, I like to think that the Japanese American Citizens League uh, is the oldest, uh, maybe not the boldest, but <laughs> the oldest Asian American civil rights organization. The goals come close to that of uh, ACLU. I think uh, uh, I think that, that the Sonoma County chapter is very, very strong and uh, doing their work. And a thank you in particular to Chair Michael Bryant and Carol uh, Kawase and Mizutani here with her son. Um, Margaret, not Margaret, um, Marie, Marie there, <laughs> Sugiyama, uh, Jason Higashi, and Lucy Kishaba, who used to be here in this county. Um, did I mention Koto? Maybe? Koto, uh, who is uh, Mizutani, who is There he is. He's going to be one of the rising stars of the show. And I'm going to be Henry Kaku. Did I miss somebody? No. Okay. The first public award that I ever received 
was from the JSL when I was really young and I didn't know what was happening. Well, I was working against Title II of the Internal Security Act of 1950, which provided for the detention of such persons who were thought to be probable candidates for espionage and sabotage. Anybody who was thought to be that could be incarcerated in, um, under the terms. The, the JCL and Japanese Americans had uh, the concentration camp in, uh, experience fresh in their mind. And so they worked far against defeating um, that act. Uh, what I learned from that experience is that you can car tar uh, start from uh, new, but people will gather around. And you can always find a group that will be helpful. And I also wanted to thank the members of the uh, Peace and Justice Center of Sonoma County. Where are you? work diligently to promote peace and justice and to their committee, the Hiroshima Nagasaki Remembrance Committee, for bringing the memory of the horror of the bombings to the public every year. And uh, Larry, are you there? Yes, okay. <laughs> you, are, you are always in the forefront of this uh, effort. And especially, a uh, special thanks to our friend Lina Hoshino. Woo! <laughs> sitting right there. She is a very uh, documentary filmmaker who made this film, the film that you just saw, and uh, who has made many films which have been shown around Sonoma County and um, on KRCD. And if you want to, if, if you want to see their uh, titles, uh, you could go to her website, right? Lena Moschino, is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, lastly, I want to uh, acknowledge the members of my family, my darling daughter, Nikki, and her husband, right there. who are right here, and my husband, who is not here, uh, uh, because they could not be, and also uh, Clay Takaya, who is my brother's son, and my dear nephew, okay, and spouse, and his spouse, Nancy Ledoche. Thank you all for the love and care which has sustained me. And so I just uh, end this thing by thanking you all and thank you for making the world a better place to be. So first I want to present the actual Jack Reeves of Liberty's Award. we have right here for you. And then I want to invite up uh, Art Romo from the Sonoma County Human Rights Commission. Here we come. Steve, and thank you to the board of the ACLU for including us in this uh, ceremony. In the past few years, as Judy Rice is chair, the commission has had a resurgence of activity, and that's why we're excited about the opportunity to express our appreciation to you, May, for uh, setting up the platform that supports our activities. And I'd like to give you just a taste of some of the stuff that we're currently doing. The basic mission of the Commission is to promote an appreciation for the cultural diversity of the county. And this includes educational activities, policy advocacy, collaborating with other organizations working on human rights, and responding to specific incidents. So far, we've offered two counterpoints public forums on the economy and on immigration. 
and we're planning another forum on human trafficking for the fall. We've also been following issues related to the rights of the undocumented workforce and their families. We passed a resolution supporting the County of Refuge concept, which unfortunately the uh, Board of Supervisors rejected. And we also passed a resolution endorsing the first version of the uh, Trust Act, and I'm sure we'll get on board with its reincarnation that's currently in the legislature. We've had presentations and discussions at our regular meetings on issues brought to us by members of the public. There was one on human rights abuses in, in Palestine. More recently, we looked into the hate crime in the town of Sonoma, and that led to an apology and further action by the Sheriff's Department. We currently uh, have task forces following issues of immigrants and economic rights. We have committees working on the Human Trafficking Forum and on a project with the Sonoma County Museum to document the history of human rights in the county. I'm not sure we will be in touch with you and the ACLU as that project unfolds. And we're especially proud of uh, the recent creation of a junior commission to involve high school students in supporting human rights. And it looks like the first group of commission, junior commissioners is a very enthusiastic and, and, and energetic group. It was in the context of all of this activity that the commission unanimously and enthusiastically agreed to present a resolution of appreciation, and this is what the resolution says. Resolution of appreciation for May T. McConnell, whereas May T. McConnell was the driving force behind the in, uh, creation of the Sonoma County Commission on Human Rights and served as its first chair, and whereas May T. McConnell, a survivor of the internment of the Japanese community in California and Colorado, went on to an illustrious career as an educator and writer, and Whereas May T. Takano has worked for decades to promote the inclusion and appreciation of Japanese culture in the Bay Area, and whereas May T. Nakano has been a tireless leader in the struggle for the human and civil rights of all minority groups, now therefore be it resolved that the Sonoma County Commission on Human Rights expresses its deep appreciation for her role in establishing the commission and the commission is pleased to join with the American Civil Liberties Union of Sonoma County and celebrating their many contributions to human rights in the Bay Area. So. Congressional recognition presented to you for outstanding service to the community, signed by our member of Congress, Mike Thompson. And another certificate of special congressional recognition, signed by our representative, Jerry Huffman. And now we have the federal government. We have. Certificate of recognition from the California State Legislature. I have two of them, which have been signed by Noreen Evans, Mark Levine, and Wesley Tesoro. And that's it. <laughs> Trevor does not shoot from the hip 
He's not a gunslinging cowboy. He's a researcher and a scholar of jurisprudence with a JD from New York Law School. After graduation, he held the prestigious position as notes and comments editor at the New York Law School Law Review. Presently, he is the executive director of the Freedom of the Press Foundation. Mr. Tim is an intellectual and eloquent speaker. Over time, he has built an image and understanding of issues our nation is facing. He has worked with the best, like Professor Nadine Strauss, Straussen, former national president of the American Civil Liberties Union, as a research staffer. Mr. Tim has been working with very reputable organizations like ACLU and the Electronic Frontier Foundation to, to understand the issues, articulate them in a way his audience can understand, organize, and he stands for the values of our nation and against those who are bent on destroying what we stand for. Trevor specializes in the issues of surveillance, free speech, and government transparency. Let's remember what one of the founding fathers of our nation, Benjamin Franklin, said, those who can give up essential liberty to obtain temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Use of drones to kill innocent people around the world in pursuit of perpetual war and terror neither achieve peace nor end terror. Many will argue today that in fact it has whipped up more hate and violence continues. Now drones making their way in our communities, drones are coming over wine country. Fresh from the war zone, drones are coming to America. Law enforcement communities want them for surveillance on us. The manufacturers, or as President Eisenhower described them, military-industrial complex, are drooling with greed. It is a threat to our privacy due to and due process of law. Yes, Trevor Tim is in the house. I don't want to alarm you as new advances in drone technology. It could be a small bird perched on your window, a tiny bug crawling around, or even a beautiful ladybug on, your, on you transmitting data in pictures and words. We have a lot of work to do. It is an important evening. We are fortunate to have Trevor Tim. His topic this evening is a threat to privacy, drone brings, and what can we do to help and protect our privacy. Without further ado, here is Trevor Tim. Please give him a warm welcome. Well, thank you, Imam, for that gracious introduction. And uh, thank you to ACL Sonoma County for having me here, and uh, especially to Steve Fabian for organizing this event. Um, I'd also like to say uh, I'm not worthy of, of following the inspirational May Nakano, so I'd just like to give her one more round of applause. <laughs> so uh, I, have a, I have a PowerPoint presentation I'm going to give here, but as it warms up, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about the organization I work for, which is the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, we are a digital civil liberties organization. If you haven't heard of us, uh, we're based in San Francisco. And we do all sorts of work with internet law, whether it's free speech, privacy, copyright and fair use, or computer crime law. Uh, some people like to refer to us as the ACLU of the internet. Uh, and that said, the ACLU does wonderful work on the internet and with technology law, and that's a little bit what I'm going to talk about today, is, is how EFF and ACLU uh, are tackling this problem of surveillance drones. So, 
This picture right here is a Predator drone. I'm sure most, if not all of you, have seen it before. Uh, it's been used by our military in the last decade uh, to kill over 4,000 people in uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and elsewhere. Uh, this military weapon, which has killed many civilians, um, along with uh, terrorist suspects, uh, is shrouded in secrecy. The government, despite the fact that it is on the front pages of the New York Times and the Washington Post almost daily now, they refuse to admit in court that it, the program even exists. The ACLU has been doing just wonderful work trying to bring light to this secretive CIA program. Uh, they have multiple lawsuits out right now uh, trying to get the CIA to admit that this program uh, exists let alone bring some accountability to it. There was a just amazing and, and, and bizarre legal ruling about a couple months ago. A judge uh, in the district court said that she couldn't bring the CIA to admit to the program because of the convoluted laws of the federal, the, the transparency laws of the federal government saying there's something out of Alice in Wonderland. The uh, appeals court thankfully overruled her and uh, the government is now being forced to admit that this program uh, finally exists. Whether or not we're going to get greater transparency and accountability uh, is remains to be seen. But this is, you know, a very complicated issue, and actually not what I'm here to talk about today. Um, what I'm here to talk about today is domestic drones. Now, uh, as many of you may have heard in the last couple months. Uh, drones are actually coming to America. They'll, in a few years, there will actually be more drones flying over the U.S. skies uh, than, they, than there will be overseas. Now, these aren't exactly necessarily these Predator drones that we see here. They won't have missiles attached to them. Uh, but they will be come in all shapes and sizes. So this is actually what a uh, domestic drone looks like today. As you can see, it kind of almost looks like a toy, but it really is not. Uh, you can actually buy these uh, online for about $300 to fly your own, but the police departments around the country are starting to buy them uh, much more sophisticated units than this. They cost upwards of fifty dollars or $100,000 or more. So, um, I, I, Imam mentioned in his opening that uh, these come in other shapes besides this as well, and I want to emphasize that that is absolutely true. You can go online and, and see a video of the head of DARPA, the Defense Department's research arm, uh, have a uh, show a demonstration of a hummingbird drone. It looks exactly like a hummingbird, and it, would, it flies around the stage and lands on our shoulder. Uh, Harvard University is now working on uh, drone swarms that are the size of insects, uh, basically five ounces in weight. So uh, I, I encourage you all to go on YouTube and, and look up these videos of these. Uh, you can see them live in action. Um, but so, you know, the, the next thing I want to talk about it is what these drones can do exactly. So the Predator drones we saw before, uh, you know, have really sophisticated high definition cameras that can basically see your shoelaces from a mile away. Uh, you know, the, the domestic drones that the police officer, that the police agencies are buying now, excuse me, have the same, have slightly less capabilities as far as high definition photography goes, but still very strong. Uh, but not only that, they can be equipped with heat or infrared sensors on their cameras, which can literally see through walls. Uh, they can be equipped with facial recognition technology. Uh, they can also be equipped with cell phone interception technology, so they could suck up potentially your text messages and phone calls. They could also lock on to the, to the GPS of your cell phone and, and potentially follow you around. Um, as I'm sure many of you being ACLU members know, uh, you know, a cell phone is, is, is a huge advance in technology and is an intimate part of pretty much all of our daily lives, but it's also become a tracking device. It sends a signal back to a cell phone tower every 7 to 15 seconds, and that can track your movement for 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. You know, when you look on your iPhone and you, you look at Google Maps and you see that little blue dot when you're lost and you're trying to find your way around, you have to realize that that information is going back to a server somewhere and is being stored. And the police can, can get this information whenever they want. Uh, they don't think they need a warrant for it. They think they can just get it with a subpoena. 
Uh, the same thing goes with uh, if they were ever to lock on your GPS of your, your cell phone with a drone. It could potentially follow you around for hours or days at a time, you wouldn't know. Um, you know, unless you actually saw the drone in the sky. Uh, and, you know, the, these manufacturers of these drones, they even openly admit that they are manufactured to carry what they call less lethal weapons, which are tasers or, and rubber bullets and beanbag guns. Now, uh, you know, many people are outraged as soon as they hear about this, and there's a few laws that are being discussed that we're going to talk about later that uh, will ban these outright. But just so you know, there is a sheriff in, in Montgomery County in Texas who has already said that he would like to use these types of weapons for to uh, to combat protesters or, or use them for large crowd control. So it's definitely something we need to keep an eye out for. Um, but so, you know, what I'm talking about here are these small drones that are about three to four feet long. But I, and you know, it's important to differentiate these but, um, these drones with the Predator drones, which are the size of an airplane. But it is also important to point out that there are Predator drones in the U.S. as well. Uh, along the Mexico and Canada border, uh, the Department of Homeland Security now owns 10 of them. Uh, they would like to own about 14 more. Uh, they fly on the border uh, looking for people crossing the border illegally. And actually, in the immigration bill that is going through Congress right now, uh, there, is, there is literally a provision that's, that will require drones to be flown 24 hours a day, seven days a week along the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, this is usually buried in news articles, but you can read about it in the USA Today and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the uh, uh, bill that was introduced by California Senator Dianne Feinstein would reduce the amount of the length that these drones can go uh, inland um, from 100 miles to 25 miles. But you should also know that the Department of Homeland Security doesn't really know what to do with these drones sometimes, so they actually loan them out to local police agencies. Uh, they admit that they do this, but they don't admit uh, how much they do this or for what purposes. So at EFF, we've actually sued DHS under the Freedom of Information Act to try to get more of this information. Uh, no result yet, but hopefully uh, we're getting there soon. Uh, you know, so right now these, uh, so I want to go back to small drones for, for a minute, which all the police agencies across the U.S. will, um, if they're not buying right now, will buy very soon. Because uh, of something called the FAA Modernization Act, which was passed back last February in 2012. This bill uh, was, it was, it was a giant bill. It, it, solved a lot of problems, updated a lot of the systems in the FAA, but buried in the middle of it was one paragraph that basically mandated that the FAA start handing out drone authorizations to any public agency that wants them. Uh, they just have to prove that they can fly the drone safely. And so uh, this was basically written by the uh, defense industry lobby, which actually had now has an offshoot of, and it's uh, a drone lobby. Uh, it's called the AUVSI. Um, and they admit, actually, that the um, Congress took their language pretty much word for word because nobody really knew this was in the bill before it passed. Uh, and so once this bill was passed, the FAA actually said that uh, there will be 30,000 drones in the sky by the end of the decade. And so there are about 19,000 towns in the U.S., so that's more than one for every town. Uh, and so the question is, what can we do to protect our privacy? Unfortunately, the law just hasn't kept up with technology. Uh, there are a couple Supreme Court cases from 10 or 20 years ago that talk about aerial surveillance. Unfortunately, they didn't go the right way. So there was one called California versus Serralo, where there was uh, a fence, a, a fenced-in yard, which the police thought may contain, may, uh, the person who lived there may be growing marijuana, they couldn't see over the fence. So they rented a plane that flew a thousand feet above his house and they were able to see in his backyard he was growing marijuana. This was challenged up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled that actually the, the person did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, and so anybody can potentially rent a plane uh, to look into your yard uh, despite the fact that a fence may prevent you from seeing it from the ground. Uh, there was also another case called Florida versus Riley, which 
um, it was another marijuana case where somebody was growing marijuana in a greenhouse in their backyard. Again, the, the cops couldn't see what was going on, so they, they rented a helicopter this time, flew 400 feet above the greenhouse, could see in the windows, and saw that they were growing marijuana. And again, the Supreme Court ruled that this was not a reasonable expectation of privacy. So, when you're outside, the Supreme Court, at least for now, thinks that you don't have privacy. And that's a huge problem. So now at EFF, we believe actually you do have privacy in your movements outside. When you're going, uh, you know, when you're walking to your work, to your home, to your friend's house, to the bar, to church, to anywhere you want to go, if somebody is following you around for, for, for days or weeks at a time, they can learn pretty much everything about you. They would know more about you than some of your closest family members. And we believe this should be protected by the Fourth Amendment. So the open question is whether courts will get here. Um, but that's a question for down the road, because unfortunately this probably this won't come up for uh, years down the road, especially if it gets to the Supreme Court. We have to realize, you know, email has been around for, for more than 20 years now, yet a case uh, talking about your email privacy has, has yet to reach the Supreme Court, so we still have a long way to go. But uh, we will get to solutions in, in a few minutes, but I just want to talk um, a little bit about what the ACLU and the FF have been doing around this issue. So, uh, before this, this FAA Modernization Act passed, uh, the ACLU was already on this case. It was amazing. Before anybody even knew this was an issue, back in 2011, they wrote a white paper, which you can read online, uh, which talks about protecting privacy from aerial surveillance, specifically drones. Uh, now, this paper was written by uh, Jay Stanley, which many of you may know, he works for ACLU National, and he writes, is the editor of the Free Future blog on ACLU.org, which I encourage everybody to check out. He's just a fantastic writer, very easy to understand, and talks about these issues uh, pretty much daily. Um, yeah, so, so part of the, the problem here is that actually we don't know a lot about what people what police agencies are doing with drones. So, you know, when I, when I was saying before, the military has this culture of secrecy surrounding drones in the military overseas, well, it's kind of spread to the United States for these domestic drones. So even though the FAA uh, releases all sorts of information, they're very transparent, actually, about, about manned aircraft. So if, you know, who's flying the aircraft, what type of aircraft, why it's flying, all this information is publicly available. But um, for some reason with drones, they refuse to release any of this. Uh, they won't even tell us, uh, originally they wouldn't tell us who was flying them. So we actually had to sue them under the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, finally, they started releasing this information last year. It's been trickling out. Uh, they usually release information that's, that's three or four months behind, and the lists are incomplete. But we know over 100 agencies have already applied for and, and received drone licenses, uh, and more are applying every day and every week. So, they started releasing this information, uh, and almost immediately, journalists started jumping on it. This was an issue nobody knew about, but all of a sudden, just because we released about 100 uh, police agencies' names and universities, uh, you know, every paper in the country was covering this. So, uh, a reporter got a hold of this information in Seattle. Uh, Seattle was probably one of the biggest cities on this list. And the reporter called up city council and asked, what do you... Did you guys approve uh, the purchase of two drones for the Seattle Police Department? And it turns out that the Seattle City Council had no idea that their police department had bought these drones. They found out about it through our lawsuit. Uh, so thanks to the ACLU of Washington, who again was on this issue much, months, months, and months before anybody knew about it, uh, they pressured the city council about this, the uh, sheriff had to go, or the, the police commissioner had to go before the city council and apologize for this, and promise to work with the ACLU of Washington to work on binding standards uh, for operating drones before they ever flew. So they were actually one of the first police stations to have them ready to fly, and yet, partially because of ACLU Washington and partially because of our lawsuit, uh, they were kept from doing so. Uh, you know, this actually turned into a huge political issue in uh, Seattle. There was protests every time that the police tried to have a public meeting about this. 
And there was even talk in the newspapers a few months ago that if city council didn't pass laws to require warrants for drone surveillance, that they would lose their seats. And so what ended up happening was uh, the Seattle mayor just decided to have to just cancel the drone program. It was a huge victory for uh, privacy and civil liberties, you know, victories that sometimes we're not used to seeing, especially with the drones. And so, you know, this is, this is very inspiring, and we wanted to do something that could kind of promote this type of behavior across the country. And yet, unfortunately, again, like I said, we don't really know what they're doing with these drones. You know, we only have their, some of their names, we don't, we don't have the other names, but we don't know what they're using that for. So at EFF, we decided to partner with a, a new website called uh, Muckrock. Muckrock is a... Uh, Freedom of Information Act website. It allows normal citizens to file their own FOIA requests. Uh, they basically you just go to their website, muckrock.com, fill out a simple form, and they will see your Freedom of Information Act request through the system, make sure that it doesn't get denied, and uh, then report about what the results afterwards. So we decided to create this uh, with Muckrock, this drone census, we call it the 2012 drone census. So we have people go online and fill out these forms. And we got almost 500 people filing Freedom of Information Act requests uh, to find out if their police agencies were using drones. Now, a lot of them came back and the police agencies were like, no, we're actually not interested. Uh, some, like San Francisco, when, when we uncovered documents showing the San Francisco Police Department, uh, internally was discussing the, the use of surveillance drones. Uh, it became a big issue. And then they, they, they denied to the press that they are interested in them anymore and basically have said that they won't pursue them. Uh, but the, the, the biggest case that we have uncovered involves Alameda County, um, you know, a county right next door, includes Oakland, uh, and their sheriff, uh, pictured here, um, he was giving an interview in October of last year talking about how he was about to he wanted to test some surveillance drones that a, a, a surveillance drone vendor was, was offering, uh, basically, to show a demonstration he wanted to be a part of it. So he told the news agency that he wanted to use these drones for emergencies, uh, for you know high-risk chases where a, a, a helicopter would normally be following, but this is much cheaper for search and rescue operations, missing children, or disasters. And you know nobody can argue with that. You know, there, there actually are good uses for drones. Searching for missing children, you know, over a large area when you don't have 10 or 20 helicopters could actually do some good. Or dropping medical supplies uh, into natural, natural disaster areas. Uh, you know, this could actually be useful for this technology. Um, so, you know, who could argue with that? But then, in the very same sentence, after he said we would only use these drones in emergencies, he said, Oh yeah, we use them to, to get marijuana growers too. And we were, we were like, what? You know, and, there, and unfortunately, there, like I was talking about before, the Supreme Court cases, there are no laws that protect people from this type of surveillance. With helicopters, it's actually, um, you know, they cost a lot. And the sheriff was saying that this is why they don't want helicopters or they want to use drones instead of helicopters. Well, actually, this, this cost is actually great for our civil liberties because it means that the police are only going to use helicopters in the worst of the worst cases, when there's true emergencies. When they, you know, as, as bad as those cases were, they had a strong suspicion that somebody was breaking the law. Um, not that those laws were just, but at least they were using it in a way that wasn't affecting everyday, everyday people's privacy. Uh, but with drones, they could basically um, use them whenever they want. You know, they may cost a hundred times cheaper, but it doesn't mean they're going to save a hundred times of the money. It means they're just going to use them a hundred times more. So what we did was we filed a public records request uh, with Muckrock, with Alameda, and we found their internal documents said that they wanted to use drones for what they said were intelligence gathering purposes, generalized surveillance, and what they called, quote, large crowd control. Now, this was different, it turned out, from what they told the Alameda County Board of Supervisors when they wanted to apply for uh, money to buy this drone. Uh, this is actually what the drone looks like. Uh, they 
told the Board of Supervisors they only wanted it to use it for emergencies. And, you know, we had this document showing that actually that's, they wanted to use it for much, much more than that. So the, the ACLU of Northern California and uh, their staff attorney um, and my partner in crime in this uh, venture is Linda Lai. Uh, she filed another public records request showing uh, the, the, the difference between what they said to the Board of Supervisors and what they said to get the federal grant to get this drone. And they tried to basically sneak this drone through the Board of Supervisors, get their approval without the public's opinion. It was, a, it was a closed door hearing. We found out about this less than 24 hours before the hearing. So we released all these documents we had. We called a press conference. And thankfully, uh, the Board of Supervisors said, oh, I'm sorry, it was actually a mistake that we put that on the agenda. We promise we didn't mean to. Agenda number 37 of like 68. Um, it was buried in there, but uh, apparently it was a mistake. And so they ended up uh, calling a public hearing, and we went there to testify, which is where this picture, picture came from. Uh, the ACLU and NDFF testified, and, talking about why we need binding rules. The, the county needs to pass rules. We can't just have the police write their own rules because they can break them unilaterally if they want. Um, you know, and, and this kind of slippery slope that we're worried about is was evident when the um, sheriff was talking at this hearing. You know, he, he talked about how he would only use these for serious crimes, for felonies. And then, Later on, during questioning, when somebody pressed him on that, he said, well, I don't want to lock myself into just felonies, you know. He decided, you know, it's, it's, basically, he wants a choice to use these drones for whatever he wants. Now, these drones, the Alameda County Sheriff wants, admittedly, only fly for about a half hour to an hour at a time. But there is a drone called the Stalker drone, which is sold by Lockheed Martin, which is a big defense contractor. They sell the military. And now they're selling to, to drone operators in the U.S. Um, it's, it weighs 13 pounds, and uh, it's well within the FAA's weight limit. Right now you can only fly drones if you're in the U.S. under 25 pounds. Uh, and it, believe it or not, you can actually go on YouTube and, and see this on the Lockheed Martin YouTube channel. Uh, the drone is recharged by a laser from the ground. And it can stay, and they tested it, and it could stay in the air for two days. Uh, basically they could just recharge it every couple hours from the ground and never have to take it down. Uh, so this is the type of technology we're looking at two or three or five years down the road. So when the sheriff says that it'll, it'll only stay in the air a half hour, we don't have to worry about it. Yes, we do, because we need to worry about it, his next drone purchase, which could be coming, you know, this, the technology he wants now will be out of date in six months. So this has become kind of this amazing political issue around the country, you know. I think when we're talking about the ACLU or EFF, we're, a lot of times we're fighting uphill battles, especially when it comes to surveillance around technology in the last decade. You know, we've had the NSA warrantless wiretapping program, we've had the Patriot Act, we've had many judicial decisions go against us talking about privacy in our cell phones and on our computers. Uh, but, you know, this issue has kind of galvanized the public. Uh, both the left and the right, probably more, uh, it's more of a bipartisan issue than, than I've ever seen in, at EFF. And so here, in just in the last year, so starting in 2013, and keep in mind that uh, state legislatures usually open up in March, so this is probably only in the last two or three months. These are all the states that have passed, or I'm sorry, have introduced and are debating drone legislation that will actually protect people's privacy. This type of legislation will go above and beyond what the Supreme Court considers reasonable expectation of privacy right now. This will mean that police agencies will need a warrant and probable cause to, to use drones for surveillance. Uh, it means that they'll be deleting their data on these, uh, everything that they suck up, whether it's you know cell phone information or your location information or the pictures, they'll be deleting it quickly. They won't be sharing it with federal agencies, these fusion centers that are all over the country that are just acting as these huge databases that everybody's information is getting pumped into. And some states are even banning them for surveillance outright. And now, you know, it's important to realize that in most of these laws, you can still use drones for 90 to 95 percent of what the police say they want to use them for, whether it's searching for missing children, 
um, you know, fighting forest fires, surveying natural disaster areas. You know, we don't want to we don't want to necessarily inhibit that. We don't want to be anti-technology. And if they would get behind these laws, they would realize that they could actually do all of this stuff uh, while still protecting people's privacy. Unfortunately, that's usually not the case. They usually say they want it for one thing and then use it for another. Um, but luckily, the legislatures are, uh, at least right now, on our side. Now, there are, uh, you know, the industry is fighting back against this. There are battles all over the country. A few have already passed. Florida has passed a drone bill. Their Republican governor signed it in after it passed unanimously in the, the House, in both the houses. Virginia, the same thing in Virginia, it was passed overwhelmingly in both houses. The Republican governor signed it. Uh, and Idaho also was the third state. And so all of these other states are, are, are passing them unanimously or close to, to unanimously. California just introduced a bill a few weeks ago. So um, the question is, you know, what can you do? You can definitely call your representative in California right now and tell them that you support the, this drone privacy legislation. The, the, the privacy legislation in California is unfortunately you know, not as strong as we would like. And so you can tell them to make it stronger. You know, I wish I followed Ashley's lead and brought you phone numbers so you can call them right now. But uh, I promise you, you can find them easily online if you can't find them now. Also, call your federal representatives because the Senate right now has three or four drone bills being introduced. Uh, you know, they're not moving right now, but if we make enough noise, then it's possible that they may pass the first meaningful privacy legislation in a decade or more. You know, if, you know, it's impossible to get anything through Congress right now, privacy <laughs> legislation is the hardest. Um, and so if you want to track these, these drone bills, you can, uh, the ACLU has a great, web, uh, a great section of their website. You can go to aclu.org slash drone laws. Uh, they give a state-by-state -state breakdown and tell you what's in the legislation and whether you should support it or not and tell you how to contact uh, your legislature. So, you know, I, I think, like I said before, that a lot of times we're faced with uphill battles. And so I want to leave you with the message that this is actually a battle we're winning. And we can continue winning if we just keep on fighting. So, uh, again, I'd like to thank everybody for having me. to destroy our civil liberties.